the best thing about being 12 year build, I've got a picture of Ethan, my son, as a three year old under the bonnet, taking out the engine. And then I've got a picture of him when he was 13 on the bonnet, when it was finished, just before this bespoke show. So which was our first show we ever did with a car. And to be able to sort of drive it there, having Ethan who worked on the car with me all the way to coming to every, every show with me, yeah, it's been fantastic. I'm Paul Foster and this is my BMW E21 Group 2 motorsport car. I've been building cars since I was about 16. Uh, my very first car was a E21 323i. Restored that with a little bit of help from my dad, going around to the brake yards buying parts. But yeah, that's where I started. This car was a packaged pair of cars. I bought both of them from Scotland. They were trailered down. The plan was to restore it as a 323i, but it grew into a full-on project. Basically, the amount of rust where it had been sat for so long, it needed new seals, new roof. So in the end, we ended up designing a Group 2 race car with a V8 engine in it, and that's how this was born. It looked fine in the pictures, but the trouble was where it had been sat in a barn, the condensation and moisture, floors were rotten. It wasn't really worth putting back on the road. And that's why it was turned into a, a race car, because I didn't need to find all the hard to find parts. Trying to find E21 parts, even 11 years ago was hard. It's even harder now. Um, but that's where the race car was born. It's just it was easier to go that route rather than a pristine car. So with the exterior, trying to restore that. Lucky enough, I had a garage at the time. So pulled everything out, all the glass, took the doors off, found where all the problems were, started to find and locate new wings. So I went to BMW Fairfield, and lucky enough, because I've got a long-standing relationship with them since the age of 16, they managed to find me new front wings, genuine wings, genuine inner seals, outer seals, genuine BMW non-sunroof roof to replace. So basically, I managed to locate a lot of new panels, new flooring, so it's had the floors replaced, because we were doing the roof, we ended up doing the roll cage first, so we could fully weld everything. So it was a combination of doing the exterior and interior at the same time, primarily just so we could get all the roll cage built in and it was tied into every part of the car. So that allowed us to cut away a lot of the bulkhead, a lot of the boot, a lot of everything else, and then we could work through from inside and outside, combining the two. So with the inside of the car, again, we managed the roll cage, got all the roll cage tied in, and that's welded to every turret, every part of the frame, allowing us to put in race seats so we could then set them up, get them where we wanted to be with that. The steering column was all welded into the roll, into the roll cage as well, which allowed us to have a wireless steering wheel so we could pull the steering wheel out for easy access. Even though it was a road car going to a race car, I wanted to build a race car that was on the road. So basically it could go down to any racetrack and be raced and then drive home. That was the, the plan for the car. So to make things easy, we had a removable tunnel made for the, so we can get to the gearbox if we need to work on the gearbox. Easy access steering wheel out. We managed to locate a wireless steering wheel so that we had no wires. With most cars, you've got a wire that hangs down. We can take the steering wheel away. And it's a good safety feature to the car because you can't start the car without a steering wheel. So take the steering wheel away. I've got a light box battery on the car so I can go onto my phone, I can kill the car, kill all the power, and there's no way of starting the car. And without a steering wheel, it's impossible anyway. So it's, that's the nice thing about having the, the race seats and then the race harnesses that will all tie into the, the, the bars. So it's super safe inside the car. A little bit noisy really hot on a hot day, really cold on a cold day, and really wet on a wet day. Because it's built as a race car, it's not watertight. So you get water in, you get the sun baking in there, it's like, it's like a greenhouse.
<coughs> but you get in the car and you automatically smile every time. So you bypass that. Whether it's rain, sunny, it's always a green factor in the car. You can't beat it. The engine in there, we originally had a 2.7 Harger engine that I built to go into it. And there is a little bit of a Harger engine car. But I always had a passion for a TVR, but I just didn't want the fiberglass, the smell. And just heaven's sake, someone said to me, look, I've got a 90 or an 80 spec TVR DTM spec engine, all in bits, ready to be built. So I ended up selling the Harger engine that funded most of the build on the car and bought me the TVR engine. And that's why this was born as a V8 TVR, which was probably one of the biggest challenges of the whole build was making a V8 fit into that engine bay. And then the headers, was an absolute nightmare. It took the guys ages to make same length headers and matching both sides. To have the car and the engine, I wanted it symmetrical. So when you looked at one side of the car and the other, they were identical. So all the exhausts had to come forward exactly the same way, have the same loops and the same lengths and then run underneath the car. So when you looked at it, if you put a mirror down it, it'd look identical whether you took the mirror away or not. But yeah, the V8 engine, you can't, you can't beat it. And coming from motorbikes, I had, um, everyone said you couldn't put motorbike throttle bodies on a car, so I did it, made it work. It took a little bit of time, a little bit of tuning, but I wouldn't change it. I know there's Gen Vs and other sort of throttle bodies out there, but I still love the motorbike throttle bodies. You can't beat them, for me anyway, especially on a TVR V8. The noise, yeah, I can't, I can't knock it. I still love it. With the suspension on the car, a few cars I've had in the past, I've always had Gaz Gold suspension. So I went to the Gaz and, and we end up getting Gaz Golds for it. It is at the lowest point it can be. The car doesn't look very low, but it is as low as it can go. I've probably got two inches of travel on the back before I hit the arch, and I've cut the arch out. But they've been really good. We've had custom springs made. We had them custom, pad custom powder coated to match the roll cage. So everything's sort of color coded throughout the car. And then with the suspension, we had the anti-dive system rather than an anti-roll bar. Uh, coming back from a, a race in the Mark II Escorts, they had an anti-roll bar system delete and then you had an anti-dive system. Again, 11 years ago, there wasn't anything around. So we made an anti-dive system for this. It's worked perfectly. Custom DTM rear arms on there to stiffen it all up. So we've got all of everything on there. So it's all adjustable. So we can adjust the camber, the toe, just like a race car. Again, it was meant to be a full blown race car for the road and gas suspension supplied everything. So we could then adjust all the top mounts, get everything perfectly set up for it. But yeah, it rides perfectly. It handles like a race car but you can drive it on the road every day. And that's the passion of it. You can go on the road, drive it, and yeah, it's, it's great fun. We've got the livery on the car. Originally, we went to uh, Mox 3D and he helped me design what I wanted to do. So we sat over the phone and emails. He came up with design for an E21 and this was the, the final sort of rendering of how it's gonna be. What I didn't wanna do is come up with a livery, get it put onto the car, not like it, it not suit the car properly. Do it once, so we done a 3D design, all on CAD, spun it around so we could see what it looked like. Originally it was meant to be painted, but the painter was really against trying to paint this livery on the car. And to be fair, he was right. At any point I can pull the livery off, leave it plain white, have it plain for a year, put the livery back on, but it will always be this livery. It will never ever change from this livery because so much passion went into designing it and getting it. And it's quite a, a modern but historic style livery for the car in the right colors. But having them done in, in vinyl wrap, pure design done that, he went away and he got it absolutely perfect. Down to the render, it was spot on. And the livery on this now is five years old, still looks new, so you can't, but he's used the best stuff on there and it polishes up. You can still polish it like a paintwork and get the shine on it. So when we go to shows, it just, it's just really, really shiny and really, really nice. But it stands out. The good thing is when you drive down the road, everyone knows it's a race car. 
everyone can see. You can see it from miles away that it's not your standard car. You can see people pull over and get their phones out and video as you go past or thumbs up. And yeah, it's, it gives you that little buzz of, yeah, I've done something right. I've got it not perfect for me, but everyone loves it. The wheels, they were the very first part I bought for the car when I decided to turn it into a race car. The wheels came as they, ha they were. They'd sat in someone's loft for about five years off a Lamborghini Contash style car. Lucky enough, they were 4x100, which suited the E21 perfectly. But they were a 345, 35, 15 rear tire. 245, 40, 15 for the front. But they didn't fit the arches. So rather than everyone going, we can reduce the wheels down, change the tires. Yeah, we just bought a Group 2 body kit. That's where the Group 2 come into it. And then we modified the arches to make them three inches wider on each side. So the car is actually not just six inches wider, but it's about 12 inches wider overall. And it was all about grip. Being a race car, a Group 2 car, it was all about how much grip I can get to the back. It wasn't about being a, a wheel spin car or a drifting car. It was that, you know, you look from behind and you've got really wide tires, you've got really wide arches. While we were doing it, there was plans, we'd done plans for aero packs for the car with the Group 2 kit. And then there was another design where it had the, the front splitter, the turbo fans, the big spoiler, the rear diffuser. Um, so yeah, we had designed everything, but for the first year it didn't have the turbo fans and the, the rear, uh, rear spoiler. So we had to get that made. But everything then led on from those wheels. So how wide it was, the stance, and then that gave us the arches and that gave us the aero pack. So it was quite a, an evolving circle of how one thing that you didn't want to change, change the whole aspect of the car, which worked out perfectly now, because yeah, there's not another one like it. But on building the car, obviously with a TVR engine, the plan was to try and get a sequential gearbox for it, but you could only run two gearboxes. There would be the, the Rover V8 or TVR gearbox, or the Cosworth gearbox. So we went for the T5 Cosworth World Cup gearbox, Kept it a standard ratio on that um, with a short shift gear linkage. Custom made prop shaft going into the original rear diff, but with a, a Quaife ATB LSD on there. And then I'd say we've got the custom made drive shafts, which were F1 rated. So they've been rifled, so they're sided with uh, 500 brake horsepower CV joints and fast boots. So it's a proper setup now, so we can take a lot more power than what it's driving out on the car. The plan is to eventually have the gearbox converted to a straight cut gearbox. Because obviously the car's already loud anyway, we have uh, an intercon system in the car, so we can talk to each other. So the whining noise from a straight cut won't really affect us too much. It will make a little bit more presence on the road, because you'll obviously have the the suction from the inlets, the exhaust noise, and now you have the wine from the from the straight cut. And there's also a company out there at the moment that are designing a sequential linkage. So hopefully we'll be have, have that on there as well. So the drivetrain on it should be fantastic with a sequential on there. It'll make it fun to drive, even more fun than it is on the road now. When I was designing the car, I was looking through a lot of Group 2 racing and, and hill sprint and time attacks. And I found a E21 that had the BMW logos on the headlights. So this is why this has appeared on the headlights of the car. It was a little feature that I, I noticed. It was on a 1960s car. Not seen it before and I quite liked it. So I can't take credit for it. I went with the motorsport style. Lucky enough, it doesn't affect any nighttime driving. And then incorporating the BMW colors into the headlight was trying to keep the theme running throughout every part of the car. So no matter what it is, when you look underneath the car, certain parts are powder coated in the blue, some parts are powder coated in the red. The purple wise, the engine block is painted in the in the purple, um, but then everything else is sort of color coded around that. With, with the car, uh, being a motorsport car, the original motorsport they had uh, the motorsport emblems. For years, I spent ages trying to find genuine BMW 
badges. Trouble is you couldn't find them anywhere. And it weren't until this year, last year, actually last year, BMW actually decided to do a 50th anniversary badge. So I could actually go into BMW. And again, because I've had a long-standing relationship with BMW for the last 20 odd years, it's been quite nice. I went in there and they managed to locate me the genuine ba or, or the genuine motorsport badges for the bonnet, the boot and the wheels. They're not period correct. They're not the original and animal badges, but they are genuine. Everything on the car is genuine BMW as far as BMW parts. So to have those was important to me. On, on top of the engine, obviously we've got the GSX-R 1000 throttle bodies on there. To optimize it as well, you've got two sets of two carbs on each side. So you've got four throttle bodies. And then I've had trumpets made so that you can have a, a pipe across air filter base, then the individual trumpets, and then you have a pipe across filter that goes across the top. We've been speaking with pipe across and they've designed a filter that goes on each individual trumpet so that we can then remove the big panel filter on each side and just have individual filters. So you can still get that really nice crisp look of eight throttle bodies, eight trumpets, all sitting there. It should look really good on there, but it keeps that flow. When you pop the bonnet, you're not got to keep removing the filters to show off the engine and the throttle bodies, but you have that on show all the time then. So that'd be fantastic once they turn up. The actual build process has been a little over 12 years, which has been quite daunting really, because you think most people give up after the first couple of years. But because of the, the constant evolving of the, from the wheels onto the body kit, onto the roll cage, onto new roof, new panels, getting everything to work, getting a TVR engine to work inside that engine bay, everything had a challenge. Everything had a knock-on effect to the next project. The best thing about being 12 year build, I've got a picture of Ethan, my son, as a three year old under the bonnet, taking out the engine. And then I've got a picture of him when he was 13 on the bonnet, when it was finished. So when we finished it about a year ago, we had just finished it just before this bespoke show. So which was our first show we ever did with a car. And to be able to sort of drive it there, which was the main thing, was to be able to drive it, turn up a show, having Ethan who worked on the car with me all the way to coming to every show with me. Yeah, it's been fantastic. You can't knock 12 years. I mean, it's still not 100% finished. We've still got little things to be done with it, but it's all the, the best thing is with the last year and a half of driving it, um, we're finding all the little issues, the little teething problems and what to improve and what to change. And there's not a lot to change. It's just little things to make perfect. Obviously, being FIA regulated, you have to have up-to-date seats, up-to-date harnesses, up-to-date fire extinguisher. The wiring loom has to be, because that was all made to be FIA and MSA approved. Having it all made new was quite good. There's lots and lots of custom parts, like the front splitter and apron. This is all movable. So the reason for the stays on here is to hold that up. And the amount of people that stand on this at shows we come back, we clean it, and we find footprints on there. And it can take a person's weight, lucky enough. Um, but this is designed to make it removable, so if ever anything happens, we can just remove the whole front end. The body kit, even though it was, it was bought in Poland, I think, and it came over, and obviously it came out of a Group 2 mould, but where it's been moulded and moulded and moulded didn't fit properly. So we've cut that, bolted the flanges to the, the body, then bonded the arch to that, then cut it down the middle and made it wider. Everything's been customised, everything from the bonnet, from the bonnet scoop to the boot floor is all, is all alley, the bulkhead's all alley to stop obviously the fuse, fumes coming through from the tank. The radiator's custom made, the tank's custom made, the Ames dash is custom made. I've sat there and designed it of an evening, I've sat there and drawn out and I've gone to people and said, what, can we do this, how do you do that? And, and people had their input, this would be easier to make and this would do this. So there's a lot of parts that you don't see that have been custom made for it. The one that catches everyone's eye the most is where we've had a race tank made, we didn't want to delete the fuel cap because obviously when you're racing, you need to have a kill point where you can reach access. On the old Mark II Escorts, they had a little pocket that had the, kill, the fire and the kill switch. So we used that, we utilized the fuel filler area for that. And me and Mark McWinston decided to put a fuel gauge in there. 
rather than having it in the car, I'll put it in there. Um, so you've got the kill switch, fire switch, and fuel gauge. Every show, everywhere you go, it seems to be that is the photo point of everybody. Everyone goes to that, and it's and it's that one point that you didn't think that anyone would notice, anyone would pay any attention to, but it's probably the greatest feature of the car. And every time you see a picture pop up on Instagram, Facebook, whatever social media site, there's always a picture of the fuel filler cap with the fuel gauge, which is didn't mean nothing to me, but it means a lot to everyone else. So the proud part of it would be it turned out 100% how I expect it to be. Without any issues, without any regrets, I can sit there and say, you know, how I designed it, how I initially planned to build it is how it came out. It took a little bit longer, like I say, having a custom spoiler made, having the custom turbo fans printed. Because obviously they're 15 inch wheels, I had, stand, I had genuine BBS uh, turbo fans from Group 5 cars, but they didn't fit and I didn't want to go up to a 16 inch wheel. So I had to get the 3D printed ones made, which was a lot of back and forth by email, getting it sort of designed, getting bits of uh, something sent over that I can print off, cut out, see if it fits, make it fit, and then send back. And I, so that was quite good that when they finally turned up, they fitted. That was really nice because they fitted perfectly and we don't have any wheel wobble at speeds. Because with uh, the traditional turbo fans, they are bolted to the wheel, um, so you can balance the wheel with the turbo fans on. These are bolted separately, so you can't, so there's a risk of having a little bit of wobble. I haven't found it with them. They've been bang on, no matter how fast or slow I go, I don't get any wobble with them. So when we go to shows, we, we try and do all different shows. We, we try and, we've been to Belgium a couple of times. We've been all over the country here in the UK doing shows with it. We get a lot of positive. There's never really any negatives when it comes to the car. Purists love it because it's, with the bonnet down, it's just a Group 2 E21. No one really sees them anymore. No one really knows much about the Group 2. No Group 5, but they don't really know the Group 2. Downside is when you open the engine bay at a BMW show, as soon as you say it's a TVR V8, everyone sort of sighs and why is it not a four cylinder? Why is it not an M12, M10? Why is it not a, a BMW V8? But I'm quite happy to shrug that off and it looks good, it drives fast. It's what I wanted. I didn't build it for anyone else. I built the car for my dream, my passion, how I wanted it. Because we so, do so many different varied shows, it has a positive reaction on all of them. And it's not something everyone sees every day. It's quite nice that people can see there's nothing to hide. There's no carpets, there's no lining. Everything's on show. So people can spend hours looking at it and picking out every little detail that there is. I, I don't tend to let people know it's my car. When I go to a show, I'll clean it and I'll disappear from the car, come back and then I listen to people's reactions and see if they can pick anything out with it. I never wanted to be that guy that, you know, oh, why is that bolt that? Why is this that? Why? No one ever does that with the car. It's always a positive reaction. The car was built for 5%. You know, the 5% of us that are really anal about a bit of dust here and whether that's the right bit, even down to the fact with the wiring loom. If you look anywhere on the wiring loom, it's got my name, BMW Group 2, V8, everywhere on the wiring loom. See little OCD points on the car that I love most people, 95% of people will never notice it, but you do get someone look and go, oh yeah, I've done, and they notice it, that's the person you're building it for. You're building it for those people that are gonna sit there and critique it as much or worse than what I can. Not many people out there that can critique it worse than me, but yeah, some people spot some things.